welcome to the Seeker Study. Um, we started with the introduction to Acts last week, and today we're going to start, oddly enough, chapter 1. So, I'm going to start reading verses 1 through 8. We'll just break it up because it's a long stretch. And um, verses 1 through 8 read, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria until the end of the earth. Verse 1, he talks about the former account he made, which is, as we touched upon last week, the Gospel of Luke. At one time, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were actually kind of joined together in one book um, with two different volumes, one before the Ascension and one after. The growth and expansion of the church um, from Jerusalem to Rome is a remarkable story. Boyce says that, humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it. It had no money, no proven leaders, no technological tools for propagating the gospel, and it faced enormous obstacles. It was utterly new. It taught truths that were incredible to an unregenerate world. It was the subject to the most intense hatreds and persecutions. Acts is written in the literary style of the Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. Um, William Ramsey, a noted archaeologist and Bible scholar, proved that the historical record of Acts is remarkably accurate regarding the specific practices, laws, and customs of the period it claims to record. It is definitely the work of contemporary eyewitnesses, which is so important. The people that actually saw these events had something to do with getting them written down on paper. It says it is in regards to what he's writing about in this account of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Notice that the former account concerned all that Jesus did and taught. Luke's Gospel describes only the beginning of Christ's work. Acts describes its continuation. And the work of Jesus actually continues to this very day. Now we're not given a full history of the church during this period. For example, the churches in Galilee and Samaria are barely mentioned and the establishing of a strong church in Egypt isn't mentioned at all. It spans a period of about 30 years, taking us to about AD 60-61, with Paul in Rome waiting to appear before Nero. And this is the Nero that began his infamous persecutions of Christians in AD 64. But wonderfully what Jesus began still continues to this day. There is a sense in which the book of Acts is actually continuing to be written today not in an authoritative scripture sense, but in the sense of God's continued work in the world by his Holy Spirit through his church. Pearson said that the Acts of the Apostles should therefore be studied mainly for this double purpose. First, to trace our Lord's unseen but actual continuance of his divine teaching and workings, and secondly, to trace the active ministry of the Holy Spirit as the abiding presence in the church. Verse 2 says, until the day in which he was token, taken up, he taught. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, instructed the apostles what to do in his absence. He had given commandments to them already, and this through the power and presence of the indwelling Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit works among those who are not yet believers, as many as us know um, personally, but also a significant work in those who believe. If the glorified, resurrected Christ needed and relied on the Holy Spirit, so should we. It's a pattern for us to follow. And it's a pattern for the rest of the book of Acts, which shows us what the Holy Spirit does in operating through his church. 
Verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. <clears throat> Jesus also established the fact of his, his resurrection with many infallible proofs during the 40 days after um, the resurrection, but before the ascension. He left no possible doubt that he was resurrected exactly as he had promised. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul describes one of these many infallible proofs. He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, it says, of whom the greater part remain to the present. More than 500 people saw him, and most of them are still alive 25 years later in the days of Paul's ministry. Now I have in your notes, so I'm not going to read them all now, um, download your notes, and you will see specific examples of his presenting himself to his followers after his resurrection, again, but before his ascension. And there's about eight listing in my listing that I have here. So take a peek. He did it to crowds. He appeared to um, individuals. He appeared to small groups of the disciples. <clears throat> he made sure that he was seen. And he was speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. During that period, after his resurrection and before his ascension, it isn't recorded exactly all that he told them. But we are told that he used the time to speak of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now we know in Matthew 3, 2 to 3, his message of, uh, was of repentance, of forsaking sin and turning to God. Of course, the gospel message. The kingdom of heaven or God referred to in Matthew and Luke in the preaching of Christ referred to the reign of God brought about through Christ by establishing his rule in the hearts and the minds and the lives of his people leading to his overcoming the forces of evil and death and the establishment of righteousness and peace. Jesus probably spoke with them about many things uh, that they needed to understand, clarifying things he taught them before that they didn't quite get. Um, on a more practical nature, perhaps he taught those things concerning the doctrine, the discipline, and the establishment of the, ch the church and the Great Commission. So, or a little of all of the above. And that's just based on what he had taught them in the past and what they needed to know now. The ascension in verses 4 through 5, his final instructions to the disciples were, in verse 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Right now there is nothing for them to do but wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. They couldn't really do anything very effective for the kingdom until they were empowered by the Spirit. And they call it the promise of the Father. And this is another example, which is kind of cool, of all three members of the Trinity listed. That there is one God and three persons. And now we see that woven all through the New Testament. And here's one of the very clear verses. It says that he, Jesus, told of the promise of the Father which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he said you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit as John baptized in water. The word used um, indicates an immersion. So instead of water, they would be immersed in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they knew the promise of the Father was going to come, <clears throat> but they didn't know when. Um, it was fulfilled not immediately, but 10 days later. Now, just before his ascension, when they had come together, and keep in mind, this is the last time Jesus that they would see Jesus in his physical body until they saw him in glory. There's nothing specific in the text to show us if they knew this would be their last time. But their question is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This was a question asked many times before, but now it had a really special relevance because they knew that Jesus had instituted the new covenant. We see that in Luke 22:20. They knew that the restoration of the kingdom to Israel was part of the new covenant, as seen in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and the verses you can look up are in your notes. Old Testament prophecies described the spiritual and the national rebirth of Israel. The disciples probably thought that the spiritual rebirth seemed certain, so the natural rebirth would also come. They also knew that Ezekiel 36 and Joel 2 said that the coming of the kingdom would be accompanied by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Hence their confusion, and it's very understandable. Stott says that the verb restore shows that they were expecting a political and territorial kingdom. The noun Israel shows that they were expecting a national kingdom 
and the adverbial clause at this time that they were expecting its immediate establishment. They wondered when the rest of the new covenant would be fulfilled. And the response of Jesus in the verses also indicates he didn't rebuke them or correct them for asking the question, but he told them that the answer wasn't for them to know. His final teachings and the final promise before his ascension are in Acts um, verse 1 to 7 through 8. It's not for you to know. He warned them against inquiring into aspects of the timing of God's kingdom because he said those things belong to God the Father alone. And it was really a wise thing for him to do. Of course, he's God. Um, it's going to be wise. But to not to outline his, line his plan for the next 2,000 years. That the disciples didn't need to know that the full restoration that they hoped would happen very soon would not come for 2,000 years. And think about how that knowledge might have affected them. Have you ever said when you've gone through a difficult trial, maybe for a lengthy period of time, had I known what I was going to go through beforehand, I would have never chosen to do this. God knows there are times when it's just best not to tell us up front. We don't, it's a need-to-know basis thing, and what we don't need to know, he don't tell us. They might have been discouraged. It might have distracted them from the work that they had to do now. And, you know, they've already had to reevaluate and readjust their lives all their expectations as time went on. Um, the time they had with, with Christ for those three years, there were a lot of their expectations and things that had to be dashed or had to be refocused and rethought. <clears throat> so, or perhaps like Paul, God may have told him at some point what to expect. It's not written. So at the same time, he, Jesus didn't say there would not be a restoration. He just said that speculation into the time and the date of the restoration was not proper for the disciple. <coughs> Excuse me. And it says it's in his own authority. Um, Jesus is showing again his submission to the Father in this. Verse 8, but you shall receive power. So the national kingdom would be delayed, but the power that they needed to do what he wanted would not. They would receive power with the Spirit's coming. But just curious about the question, if the restoration of the kingdom of Israel was on their mind. Is it possible they might have still seen this power too much in terms of a ruling kind of power, like Caesar would have, or in God's kind of power? And we don't know how they thought about that, except the answer would be question, uh, the question would be answered eventually. And Christ said, you'll receive power and you will be witnesses to me. The natural result of receiving this promised power would be that they would become witnesses of Jesus all over the earth. This is why God empowered them with his spirit, so they could fulfill his commission. <clears throat> Not to usher in the new kingdom, but to be witnesses to him. <clears throat> and where would they take this message? To Je in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the progress of the spread of the gospel. And it actually becomes kind of an outline of the book of Acts, because Acts 1 to 7 describes the gospel in Jerusalem. 8 to 12 speaks of the gospel in Judea and Samaria. And Acts 13 to 28 tells of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. And we have to wonder that the disciples may have had some objections to uh, regarding these places of ministry Christ had laid out. Jerusalem, after all, was where Jesus was executed. Judea had rejected his ministry. The Samaritans were regarded as impure half-breeds. And in the outermost parts of the earth were the Gentiles, who were enemies and were seen as unclean pagans. And I'm putting that lightly. Yet God wanted a witness sent to these places, and the Holy Spirit would empower them to do that work. Now I'm going to read verses 9 through 14, starting with when Jesus ascends into heaven. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, <clears throat> who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen, as you have seen him go into heaven. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, 
which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. It says then he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And actually in Luke 24, 50 to 53, we are told that he blessed them. The cloud that received him is suggestive of the cloud of glory associated with God's presence. Perhaps another clue is if there was any doubt to who he was. While they watched, he was taken up. It was kind of important for Jesus to leave his disciples in this manner. He could have simply vanished into heaven and went into the Father's presence but by ascending, by ascending in that manner. But Jesus confirms who he is. He let his followers know in this way also that he was gone for good. This is opposed to the way when he appeared and reappeared during the 40 days after his resurrection. Remember Jesus' words to his disciples in John 16, 7. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now the disciples could know that the promise would soon be fulfilled. And the Holy Spirit was coming because Jesus promised to send a spirit when he left. Verse 11, these two men, apparently angels, said, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? They told the disciples basically to put their attention in the right place, not in wondering where and how Jesus went. He told them they had to go to the ends of the earth and here they were gazing into heaven, which I would have been doing too. This same Jesus, they say, a reminder that Jesus ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. <coughs> it's the same Jesus of the gospel. And it said he will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He'll come back the same way he left. He left physically and will come back physically. He left visibly, visibly and will come back the same. He left from the Mount of Olives and will return there. He left in the presence of his disciples and will come back to them. He left blessing his church, and he will come back doing the same. Verses 12 to 14 talk about the followers of Jesus returning to Jerusalem. The Sabbath day journey. He took them to Jerusalem to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that's what they did. They were obedient in this. When they entered, they went into the upper room. There were about 120 present. It tells us in the verses who they all included the 11 disciples, 12 minus Judas, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the brothers of Jesus, such as James and Jude, the women who followed Jesus, and others, likely wives and close family members. If you'll note in there, the brothers of Jesus, Jesus did have siblings. Matthew 13, 55 to 56 says after his resurrection, this was after his resurrection at Nazareth, and I quote, is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joses, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? When, where then did this man get all these things? At the very least, Jesus came from a family with four older brothers and two sisters, seven in total. Sisters were not named, and there may have been more in number, we just don't know. The brothers never seemed to be supportive of his ministry before his death and resurrection, we see from John 7:5. But after encountering the resurrected Christ, they became followers. <clears throat> and verse 14 tells us that when they were in the upper room, they all continued with one accord. This is unity. When we see the disciples in the Gospels, they're often bickering. So what changed? Simon Peter still betrayed the Lord. Matthew was still the tax collector. Simon was still a zealot. Their differences were still there. But the resurrection Christ was greater than any differences between us, between them, and between us. 
Their focus was no longer on each other, but on him and on what would come next. They didn't know what to expect exactly, but they knew they had to stick together to face whatever would come. And while they were there, they were in unity and they prayed and they supplicated. They prayed together. And it says they continued in prayer and supplication. Now supplication has a sense of desperation and earnestness. It's not a simple prayer we're tossing up to God because we want something. This was serious. Now already we see three important steps in making godly decisions for us. They were in obedience, they were in fellowship, and they were in prayer. Now verses 15 through 20, they're going to talk about a replacement for Judas. And in those days, Peter stood up in the middle of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. <clears throat> and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Verse 18. Now this man, Judas, purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out, and it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. <laughs> Excuse me, doing a lot of talking today. Verse 15, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. And this is cool. Peter took this natural leadership role. And if you'll notice in, back in the Gospels, he often was a spokesman um, among the disciples when Christ had his earthly ministry. However, the idea that he was supreme and that he handed it down in unbroken succession is not seen here, nor is it biblical. Verse 16, men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled. And this is really cool because from what they've been through and what Peter did in his betrayal, this shows wisdom that he, we don't often see in Peter before. He's assuring the believers that this was part of God's purpose. Jude didn't pull a rug out from under God. The enemy didn't get his way. This was part of a plan. Um, he, so Judas did not actually stymie God's plan or cause God to go, uh, oops, i got to come up with a backup. No, it was God's plan. Judas simply fulfilled it, which is kind of cool here because <clears throat> what we see in Peter, this growth we've seen in Peter, this is proof for us that we gain strength and wisdom and even maturity for our trials from our trials if we draw close to him. If we see those trials as something that God has either ordained or allowed for our benefit and for his glory, if we acknowledge his sovereignty in all situations. It says in verse 17 that he, Judas, was numbered with us, meaning he was with them. He was witnesses to the acts of the Lord. He went with them, he walked with them, he heard the teachings, he saw the miracles. <clears throat> falling headlong verse 18 he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out um, literally the burst open is like to crack something open entrails are your internal organs specifically the intestines gushed out is pretty self-explanatory Luke says basically that he fell into a field and his body ruptured now curiously Matthew says that Judas died by hanging Matthew 27, 5 says, So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. So did he die by hanging? Or did he die by falling? Or are both true? We know that Judas hanged himself in the potter's field from Matthew. And that's how he died. Then, piecing it together in a way that makes the most sense, after his body had begun to decay, the rope of the branch broke, and his body fell, bursting open on the land of the potter's field. That's what it says in Acts. Luke does not say Judas died from the fall, only that his body fell. So the Acts passage presumes Judas is hanging, 
that he was hanging because falling in a field, if you just trip over a stone and fall in the field, your entrails aren't going to pop out. It just wouldn't normally happen in your body bursting. But unless you had an alien living inside of you, but that's another story. But decomposition and a fall from a height could do that. So Matthew mentions the actual cause of death, the hanging, and Luke focuses more on the event following, to which I want to say, ew, again. Verse 19 tells us this happened in Jerusalem in a place called Alkeldama, the field of blood. Uh, this, sense, this name has been connected with a plot of land south of the Old City in the Hinnom Valley. It was a field of blood, <clears throat> not only because Judas spilled his blood there, but because the field was purchased with blood money um, given to the betrayer of Christ. The money, as I said, was used to buy a potter's field which became a burial ground for foreigners. <coughs> Little note on the potter's field, for those of you who like trivia, the potters, people who made pottery, actually excavated and gathered a very high quality, deep red clay to make their ceramics, which could be another reason it was also called a field of blood. As a result, the land became barren. Um, it was unsuitable for farming, but was very well suited as a graveyard. The whole area in and around the Hinnom Valley, if you Google it today, is full of burial caves cut into the rock face. They're kind of cool. The word potter's field um, is derived from the English Bible, and it survives even today. In some places, they're called pauper's graves or a common grave, <coughs> which is a dedicated plot in the municipal or communal cemetery where criminals, unidentified or unclaimed bodies, or the poor are buried or where there's um, cremation is used, where the ashes are scattered. I remember growing up as a child, and um, when we would go visit the cemetery, because um, I love cemeteries, there was always this big empty field off to the side of the cemetery where most of our relatives were buried. And I would ask my mom, what is that for? Because there weren't really grave markers over there. And uh, this was a Catholic cemetery. And she said that that's unhallowed ground. That Babies who were not baptized, um, that's where they were buried. And that was where my first time, my experience was something called a potter's field. Now the Valley of Hinnom is located on the southeast side of Jerusalem and became the city dump. And they chose it wisely because the prevailing winds generally carried the smell away from the city, which is always a good thing to do in city planning. Dead animals from the temple sacrifices were thrown there where they would rot and beaten by worms and maggots. Trash was there, the sewage was emptied there from the city. Um, as one commentator said, it was smelly, ugly, burning, crawling with worms, full of rot and full of diseases. During the Old Testament period, many of the Israelites sacrificed their children to Moloch and Baal in the Hinnom Valley. Leviticus 22 says, you shall also say to the sons of Israel, any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of their offspring to Moloch shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. King Manasseh of Judah sacrificed some of his own sons in worship of Baal. Second Chronicles 33 tells us that he allowed his sons to pass through the fire and did much evil in the sight of the Lord. It is believed, and I have a little picture of what it's thought they'd look like in your notes. It's believed that the idols of Moloch were giant metal statues of a man with a bull's head with his arms outstretched and that almost made a ramp into a hole in his midsection. The fire was lit and they placed their babies into the statue's arm or into the hole. So couples would sacrifice their firstborn, believing that Moloch would ensure financial prosperity for their family and future children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. Appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, often the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. In Jesus' time, the Greek translation of Hinnom Valley is Gehenna, and it became a synonym for hell. With its pagan history and the burning stench from the fires there, the Hinnom Valley served as a vivid metaphor, a picture, for both the Christian and the Jewish concepts of hell. So, getting back to the verses. Um, we see here 
it says in Acts 1, 18, that now this man purchased the field, this man being Jude, Judas. Matthew 27, 6 or 7 says the chief priests picked up the coin and said it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's, potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. So Matthew said the priests bought it. Luke says Judas bought it with money, with the wages of iniquity, which is money gained unrighteously. So who actually bought the field? They can't both be right. A couple possibilities. You'll find more if you go online. These two seem reasonable. Judas was promised the reward before Christ's arrest. Um, sometimes during the days leading up to the betrayal, he may have made arrangements to purchase a field. Though no money had yet been paid, or perhaps he made the down payment with the wages of iniquity, which could have been the money he stole, because we are told um, in the New Testament that Judas did steal from basically the coffers. Um, so after the betrayal, Judas returned the money to the chief priest. They considered a blood money, and they basically completed the, completed the transaction Judas had started and bought the field. And I was asked, why do you think they would, he would even want a field? Um, of course, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. I did notice that he is the only apostle excuse me, the only disciple who was not from Galilee. He was from out of town, basically. So he didn't have any family here. Perhaps he wanted to set up shop permanently. I don't know. The other one is that when Judas threw the 30 pieces of silver down, the priest took the money and used it to buy the potter's field, as we're told in Matthew 27. Um, if Judas didn't purchase the field separately, but provided the money for the transaction through these 25 pieces of silver, um, it, he could then said to be the purchaser of the field because in essence it was his money. Now, verse 20, for it is written, important here, this is reliance on God's word. It's a principle revealed in scripture. Peter is quoting here from two Psalms that suggest why God wanted them to choose another disciple to replace Judas. And he quotes from Psalm 69 and 109. This is also the first time we read that Peter quoted scripture. Just saying. It says, let his habitation be desolate, let another take his office. This is David quoting, because he wrote the Psalms. He's quoting David. David knew what it was like to be betrayed. The words quoted here were spoken against his enemies. Um, we know in, in response to someone who had betrayed him. And then we know that sometimes David is used as a type of Christ. So when David was betrayed, he desired the betrayer would be desolate and another would fill his office. So it isn't hard to understand that the son of David, whom David often prefigured, would desire the same thing. And uh, the verses that I'm kind of referring to are Psalm 109, 6 through 9. This was from a desire for God's will, making this choice to replace him. Because of the principle of that scripture which they quoted, they decided to replace Judas because they believe it is what Jesus would have wanted. Now I'm going to move on to verses 21 to 26. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. Verse 20 and 21, one of them must become a witness with us. They, did, they were bold enough to make a decision based on God's word. Um, they still had not received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on them, but God didn't leave them without guidance. They knew what to do from the word. Even when we don't sense a special guidance from the Holy Spirit, we have God's voice permanently established in his word. Of course, if we do sense something from the Holy Spirit, we know that guidance will never disobey or contradict God's written word. As always, test everything. 
So Peter proposes that another man be chosen to take Judas's place. It has to be someone who accompanied us all the time, who had been with them since Jesus baptized him, who stayed with him during the days of his ministry on earth, and who was witness to the resurrection. Their decision here came when they were in, remember this, they were in unity, they were in fellowship, they were in prayer, they were in obedience, they were in the scriptures, and they were desirous of knowing God's will. These were very reasonable requirements for a successor to Judas's office. They needed someone who could fulfill their commission. And it was important that they says that um, they'd be a witness of his resurrection. And this was the main job of a disciple that would remain, replace Judas. Now that Jesus had ascended, it was more important than ever to have a witnesses to his resurrection. Like we also can be witnesses to his resurrection, both by trusting and proclaiming their testimony and our testimony that the risen Christ lives and works through us. So the two men were Joseph, Justice, and called Barsabbas, and Matthias. Now the Gospels do not mention these two by name, but we know there were at least 72 other men besides the 12 whom the Lord had commissioned for ministry, Luke 10. Yet Peter and the others were familiar with these men, and their constant faithful discipleship made them stand out as worthy candidates. So they prayed and they cast lots. Starting with prayer is a good thing. If we remember that the night before Jesus chose his disciples, he prayed. That was in Luke 6, 12 to 13. The disciples, following his example, prayed to know. Prayed to the Lord and, and asked him to, who he would add to their number. And they cast lots. Now this seems odd. Uh, many people question the method for choosing one of the two men. It seems that despite all these wonderful things they're doing spiritually to lead up to this moment, they end up essentially rolling dice to pick the winner. Um, is this really any way to choose an apostle? <clears throat> well, they were not yet filled with the Spirit, yet with what they did know, they were relying on God. Maybe they remembered Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Now the New Testament doesn't teach us to use a method, any method similar to casting lots for decision making. However, in this case, nor does it condemn the way they made this decision. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. Matthias means gift of Yahweh. Trusting that God's hand was in it, they received him as a replacement for Judas. And nothing else is really known of Matthias. But the bottom line in this is God is sovereign. If it was not his sovereign will for Matthias to be chosen, Matthias would not have been chosen. Beside the boat, the Bible nowhere condemns Matthias being chosen. Um, so, perhaps it really does seem that God did not want the office left vacant. Now, before I close, I just want to touch on two things, this casting lot thing. In the scripture, it's mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New. Significantly less, because we're not to rely on it. It's not a pattern we're supposed to follow now that the Spirit has come and dwells within us. In spite of these many references, nothing is really known about the actual lots themselves. They could have been like sticks of various lengths. They could have been flat stones like a coins or some type of dice. The closest modern practice to casting lots is likely flipping a coin or rolling dice. The practice occurs most often in the Old Testament with the division of land under Joshua. Scriptural references are in your notes and a procedure that God instructed the Israelites on several times in the book of Numbers to use. Scriptures are in your notes. He allowed the Israelites to cast lots in order to determine his will for a given situation, to determine various offices and functions in the temple, and here in the New Testament, they cast lots to replace Judas. Now that we have the completed word of God, as well as the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us, there's no reason to be using games of chance to make decisions. The word, the spirit, and the prayer um, are sufficient for discerning God's will today. Now, regarding Matthias being the wrong choice, if you research this at all, you're going to come across some things, and I just want to bring a few of them up. Some still insist that Matthias was the wrong choice and that the use of lots in making the decision wasn't right, since Jesus told them to sit and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
You know, they should have just been basically sitting on their hands and not doing anything except praying. The idea here is that Paul, not Matthias, was God's choice for the 12th apostle. Matthias is never again mentioned in the New Testament. That was compelling <clears throat> because Paul became very prominent in the early Christian church. But that's not unusual. Except for Peter and John, none of the original 12 are mentioned after Acts 1. Paul was definitely more prominent than Matthias was by what we read. But Paul was more prominent than any of the 12, except for perhaps Peter and John. Also, based on the apostles' criteria, Paul would not have qualified. So a conclusive biblical case cannot be made for the 11 apostles' choice of Matthias being invalid. As for Paul, he clearly considered himself apostle, but one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15.8, and it doesn't seem that he anywhere objected to the selection of Matthias. Revelation 21.14 tells us that each of the twelve foundations of New Jerusalem has the name of one of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. When we get to heaven, I guess we'll find out. In the interim, bottom line, we respect the testimony of Scripture in this. Next week, we'll be starting Acts 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.